So what I want to do in the next uh, 40 minutes or so is tell you a little bit about uh, my research, about our work on how to close gender gaps, in particular focusing on what behavioral science has to offer, kind of understanding how our minds work, how that can translate into interventions to close some of these gaps. So let me start by showing you kind of this slide here and kind of I imagine that some of you are here because you care about some version of this pyramid. This pyramid might be in your own field at the medical school, it might be in the world, or at, uh, you know, at, at any other place. Uh, this is a statistic for the US kind of showing the fraction of women at the entry level, and then kind of as we go up the pyramid, we have fewer and fewer people in women in leadership positions. So that might be one of your kind of motives, but I want to suggest to you that while this is a motivation, for some women and girls, gender equality is a matter of life and death. So I want to take a slightly bigger perspective for a moment um, and remind us that gender side still is real. This, in fact, is a cover of The Economist from a few years back. The United Nations now estimates that about 200 million women and girls are missing because of sex-selective abortion or neglect in the first five years. 200 million women is a big number. That means zero women living in the United States. So for some, gender equality really does matter. But even for a thorny, problem like this, I want to suggest to you there's some hope. So one of my very favorite studies uh, is a study that Rob Jensen, who's now at Wharton, he used to be at the Kennedy School, now at Wharton, uh, conducted. He's an economist, like I am, a development economist, and his work focuses on this big question of gender side. And what he was trying to understand was whether even the poorest of the poor think about something quite economic as they are investing or not in their children. So his question was, what if we increase economic opportunities for women in these countries where we still have gender side? Would the parents then treat their daughters any more favorably? And what he did was he took advantage of the fact that call centers moved into India in large numbers in the 90s and also preferably hired women. And so then he explored the fact whether that impacted the survival chances of zero to five-year-olds. He did that in a um, true kind of natural science way, which is kind of now also how we do research in social sciences quite a bit, in an experimental way. So he had a treatment group, 200 villages which got the treatment, they got training for women to go and work in call centers, and he had a control group, 200 other villages, which didn't get the treatment. And then he measured, in fact, working with um, medical faculty, then he measured um, health, body ma mass index, survival chances, education, et cetera, and found that, in fact, having the opportunity to work, and these are, of course, the 25 to 40-year-olds, but having the opportunity of work affected how parents treated their zero to five-year-old daughters and increased their survival chances. So I just want to leave this with you as a bigger objective for all of us, that we should care. We should care because of our lives, but we should also care because for some people, this literally is a matter of life and death. But I want to take you back to this part of the world. In fact, we're now going to California. And I want to introduce you to Heidi Roizen. Heidi Roizen is a venture capitalist. And she, I mean, is famous uh, in her own right, a very successful businesswoman. But she also became famous because a case study that was written about her now is one of our favorite tools to teach about implicit bias in the moment. And some of you are nodding uh, because you might have been in a Harvard Business School class environment or some other environment where this case was taught. It's a typical kind of case study which talks about how Heidi became a successful businesswoman, an entrepreneur, venture capitalist, uh, built her networks in Silicon Valley. Um, so that's the case. And then a few years after Kathleen McGinn, who is um, a professor at the business school, wrote the case study, some colleagues of ours at Columbia Business School took this case and replaced Heidi's name by Howard. 
And we're now giving half of our students the case of the protagonist being called Howard, and the other half the case of the protagonist being called Heidi, and then students read the case, prepare for class, and fill out a survey at the end, asking them how they thought about the performance of Heidi and Howard, and also how much they liked Heidi and Howard. Would they want to work with them? Would they hire them? And what we find time and again is that people agree that both Heidi and Howard did a good job, but we don't like Heidi. We don't like Heidi because she, she defies the norms of what a good woman does, and she defies the norm of what a typical venture capitalist looks like. We often refer to this as the competence likability dilemma that women, but not men, face. It's very hard for women to be perceived as both likable and competent. And by the way, before I continue, um, a footnote, because I'm happy to have a broader discussion in our Q&A session on gender identities. Um, I am going to use kind of men and women in a simplified way um, in my talk right now. But I'm, happy to, I'm, ha I'm certainly very happy to go there. So women tend to, uh, tend to face more of this gender, uh, of this, excuse me, competence likability dilemma um, than men. It's you're either perceived as competent or as likable. And Heidi was perceived as competent, but not as likable. So that's what we're up against. Um, so I wanted uh, you to ask, um, I want to ask you, excuse me, to take a look at this picture here and compare squares A and B for me. And I presume that most of you see square A as being darker than square B. I'm now gonna hopefully prove to you that you are in fact wrong and that the two squares have the same color. I'm gonna quickly go back uh, because sometimes verification is better than trust uh, to show you that I literally didn't do anything to B. I think it is actually important to see it in both ways because even now that you know that B is just another dark square, you are incapable of doing justice to be. Right? I quite literally have to liberate your mind to see B for what it really is, namely another dark square. I'm arguing that that's what we have to do for gender equality. We have to make it easier for our minds to do the right thing. Because I'm actually arguing that this is what you do when you see people. You put them into boxes, they're patterns in the world, and if you don't see many male surgeons, you don't naturally associate that job with men. If you don't see many female teachers, you don't naturally associate that job with women. I know I chose counter-stereotypical examples here. But you put people into boxes depending on the images that you have, the patterns that you're used to from the world. And what we want to do is help you get out of those patterns to actually see talent, for example, where it really is. Let me give you an example on talent. So quite literally, this is what many of the orchestras have done. They've liberated orchestra selection committees and directors to hear talent where it really was. They introduced the blind auditions and had musicians audition <coughs> behind a curtain. It's one of the most famous examples that many of you are probably familiar with, also introduced by the Boston Symphony Orchestra and it increased the likelihood that women would advance to future rounds by 50% and contributes to an increase of the fraction of women on those orchestras from about 5% in the 70s to now almost 40%. That's kind of the 10 major orchestras in the US, symphony orchestras in the US. So again, the curtain, the blindness of the evalu evaluation procedures liberated people's minds and ears to in fact be able to hear the music. So that's where I want to take you today on this journey of behavioral design. How can we redesign our organizations, our hiring processes, our promotion processes, but more generally you'll see organizations including schools and tests, etc., to make it easier for us to get things right. I want to start um, with a behavioral design that has nothing to do with gender, just to suggest to you the kind of things that you want to look for. So here's um, an interesting phenomenon, and that is that sometimes you attest beforehand that you will say the truth and nothing but the truth. 
This is not true in all countries, but it is true in this country that when you testify in court, you will attest that you will say the truth of nothing but the truth before. But then when you complete your tax bill, <coughs> you will sign at the end. And that's a question for a behavioral designer. Does it matter whether we do this before or after? So colleagues of mine ran an experiment. Um, and they ran an experiment both in a laboratory um, and also with an insurance company where they either had people sign at the beginning or at the end. And what they found was is that, so think of this as a, I'm actually going to talk about the lab study, simple lab study that some of you might have participated in. You come to the lab, you're normally given a show up fee, $10, $20, and then you might also get uh, some pay for performance for participating in whatever task it is that the researchers are studying. Now, in this particular uh, experiment, people didn't get a show up fee, but the participants were asked to claim expenses. And we understand some of you come from South Boston to Harvard, some of you come from across the street, some of you had to park your car, uh, car in the parking garage. Just let us know how much, it uh, how much it cost you to come here. And if you sign at the beginning, on average, these are random samples, so the numbers should be the same. On average, people claim half as much as people who sign at the end. How is that possible? When you sign at the beginning, what we do is we trigger a part of your identity. You now want to think of yourself as an honest person because you just attested that you're an honest person. And you now want to live up to those standards. If you sign at the end, often what we find is that the self-serving bias kicks in. And you're like, well, I might have overclaimed slightly, you know, my tax form and the donations, and I don't remember them all, but surely it was more than 500. Um, and you justify basically your previous behavior. They found the same thing for the insurance company. Uh, people overclaim uh, when they sign at the end instead of when they sign at the beginning. They're now working with the first country which is going to change its tax form. And people have to sign at the beginning that they will complete honestly. So that's design. That is the power of design. I want to leave you with one other design before I go back to gender. And that's this. This is not research, but um, just for you to remember. Many of you probably have been in a hotel room at some point where the room key card did not just serve the purpose of opening and closing doors, but also of turning lights on and off. As you might imagine, just a little bit of technology makes it so much easier for us to do the right thing. Even the well-intentioned among us in this room will have left the light on in the bathroom when you left the hotel room. So a little bit of technology, a little bit of design. This, of course, is very, very different from the many other things that our organizations are doing these days. And in the first part of the book, I do try um, to collect any evidence that I could find, any experimental evidence, any ex ex evidence I had ever tested, <coughs> whether any of these are working. And I have to tell you, on some of them, the news is not particularly encouraging. So for example, diversity trainings are either not measured, but if they are measured, they typically do not work. Why? Because our minds are pretty stubborn beings. You idiot, go back to the checkerboard example. Even though you knew that B was another dark square, your mind was imp incapable of actually doing justice to B. It is very hard for us to follow through on our virtuous intentions that we might have in a diversity training program. So I wasn't particularly encouraged um, by that evidence. It does get better as we go down the list. The more any training or any intervention that we might do also incorporates capacity building, where we actually help people follow through on whatever they might have learned. What does this mean for your daily life? So if you do an unconscious bias training, for example, it's excellent for awareness raising, it's excellent for opening doors, but then we have to add the next step. So what does this mean? What kind of behaviors does it might trigger? So really getting very concrete as in what micro inequities do these unconscious biases lead to? So for example, interrupting each other or not giving credit to someone's um, contribution in a meeting. Really going into the behaviors and then thinking about what interventions would change those behaviors. So that's where I want to take you. I want to talk about kind of three applications. The first one is talent management. You'll, you'll see I'll take them 
a broad um, perspective here beyond academia, but I'm happy to also talk about academia um, later on. Uh, then I want to talk a little bit about kind of what more we can do in our organizations, um, and then if we have time, talk a little bit about diversity in teams. So let me start by super low-hanging fruit that um, is also relevant for us in academia. And these are our job advertisements. I would argue that we do not use the same kind of scrutiny for attracting people that we use when we think about product design. We've actually been quite clever and quite, uh, quite rigorous in our marketing department, really trying to understand what color, what size, what brand, what image works for whom, for different categories of people. So here's one example, Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola and all other soft drink companies re realized about 15 years ago that diet wasn't working for men. Now, maybe men don't care about their calories, or maybe they run more, or maybe diet isn't their, isn't their word. And that's exactly what they found. And so they replaced diet with another word, with zero. Pepsi replaced diet with Pepsi Max. And you know, as you think more about this, you'll see that m much, much branding is in fact gendered. So there's of course um, Venus Gillette, for those of us who prefer, prefer pink to purple, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not arguing that it's right or wrong. I'm just describing what the world is like. And I am suggesting to you that we should, in fact, use the same kind of scrutiny when we think about our job advertisements. So here's a school that approached us because they wanted to increase the fraction of male teachers. As you probably know, about 15% of our teachers are men. Elementary school teachers now are men, which increasingly is a problem for boys, as they no longer have male role models, particularly for the counter surgical subjects, such as reading and writing. And so this is a school that wanted to have more male teachers. Uh, they, uh, I show you an excerpt from their job advertisement, which read like this, looking for a warm and caring teacher with exceptional pedagogical and interpersonal skills to work in a supportive, collaborative work environment. In fact, a little bit of uh, big data analytics can tell us that these are gendered adjectives that are traditionally associated with women. I'm not saying men cannot be caring or supportive, of course. What I am saying that research shows that in our minds, we associate them with women more so than with men. And this ad will substantially decrease the likelihood that men will apply. So another ad could be simpler and say, looking for an excellent teacher with exceptional pedagogical skills, for example. There's now software out there. Um, a number of startups have taken this to heart, developed software that allow all of us to quickly run any text but also job advertising through the software just to understand how biased the language is that we're using. It's a bit more complex than what I'm showing you here, but that is kind of the essence of it. Imagine letters of recommendation. In fact, we're thinking about using this for letters of recommendation now because letters of recommendation typically are fraught with biased language. So that's low-hanging fruit that I think anyone should be doing. Now we're getting to somewhat more difficult, um, kind of higher hanging fruit, and that is the evaluation of job candidates. So these are now your applicants who've made it into the door and you're now evaluating them. And I want to kind of debunk some myths and then also give you some suggestions on how we might be able to improve. So first myth is that diversity on the evaluation committee itself will solve our bias problem. This is not true. I'm simplifying here a little bit, but generally, who you see is more important than who you are. So seeing is believing. If you don't see male kindergarten teachers or male nurses, you will not associate those jobs with men. And if you don't see female venture capitalists, for example, we won't associate those with women or Heidi uh, in my example before. So that's one thing. A second um, concern I have about this you know, cheesy picture here is the panel. Many organizations, um, less than academia, although I don't know about the medical um, area, um, interview job candidates on, in panels. It turns out that these three people will not be able to come up with independent assessment of the candidate. That is called group think. They will influence each other. So much better than having a panel interview, 
be to have three separate interviews, one-on-ones, -on -ones, which in fact is not more costly for the interviewer. It is more time consuming for the interviewee, but not for the interviewer, and then you have three different assessments of the candidate. And thirdly, and of course I'm reading much into this, um, they might actually be conducting an unstructured interview. The unstructured interview where you just kind of talk, kind of generally about the job, maybe also about your hobbies, turns out to be the worst predictor of future performance. And there's literally dozens of studies showing this, and it still is the most beloved tool of most organizations in the world. Why? Many of us think that, yeah, you know, bias might, you know, there might be bias out there, but I'm just gonna feel it. I'm gonna <laughs> look at you and I'm like, yeah. It actually, um, so I served a, a, as academic dean for, for a few years at the Kennedy School, and it did happen to me once that I interviewed somebody uh, who also was a synchronized swimmer. I used to be a synchronized swimmer, the first and only person in my life I've ever interviewed who was a synchronized swimmer. I did a structured interview, and that, but I learned about it at the end, so it didn't affect my judgment. But in any case, as soon as she told me, I was like, Harvard professor? Yeah. <laughs> so, so what can we do instead? So what did I do? I used a structured interview instead. Um, there's more things you can do, but as a first step, um, kind of acknowledging that we all, in fact, care about seeing somebody, that we probably won't overcome that, even though seeing people is fraught with bias. What you can do is at least prepare the questions beforehand and then use the same, let's say, five questions. There's no magic here. The five questions, and you'll ask the very same five questions of all of the candidates that you see in the same order. Ideal, excuse me, ideally, you rate every answer after you've, after you've asked every question so that you can basically start from scratch with the next question. You rate them, you rate them comparatively. At the end, you submit them to a machine. The machine cal calculates an average of all the interviewers, and before you even go to a meeting, you come in with a score that is based on the average of everyone. So there's a bit more to that um, that I go into more detail in, in the book, but I think the important message here is let's formalize our informal procedures because informality opens the door to biases because we want to fill in the blanks with something that we know already and often these are stereotypes. Even better than a non-structured interview or in addition to a non-structured interview are of course work sample tests that can, are very close to the actual job that you will be performing in the future. Okay, so the more we move away from kind of our intuition and the more we allow kind of some procedures to guide our judgment, the more research would suggest we in fact give Square B a fair chance. But let me also talk a little bit about pr promotions because Many of you won't just care about the entry level, but also as you climb up the career ladder. This was my pyramid from the beginning. Uh, and I wanna kind of maybe leave you with two insights. The first one is that what we found was that many companies evaluate their employees based on performance, literally often on the x-axis, and future potential on the y-axis. As you might imagine, we're much more likely to find gender bias in potential, because that is harder to measure it's forward-looking, and that's when we fill in the blanks. Does she look like somebody who has the potential to be a senior anesthesiologist? And that's when the stereotypes kind of come in handy for us to kind of understand whether she fits or he fits the role that we're looking for. Now, potential, of course, is a hard problem for us because I totally acknowledge that there are situations where an engineer wants to move into a managerial role, right? So maybe past performance is not such a great predictor of future potential, future performance. And I don't actually have research um, to show whether this works or not, but what I have been doing when I work with companies is to say, at the very least, define potential for me. Break it down into something more objective, measurable. Is it communication skills? Is it team leadership? Is it what do you mean with potential? Don't just tell me you're feeling it when I look at you, but verbalize it and ideally quantify it. The second um, insight I want to leave with you is the following. Many organizations, uh, including uh, 
Harvard, at least my part of Harvard, so I don't know about the medical areas. Um, Phil uses the following process, and that goes as follows. We ask our employees to self-evaluate themselves and then share their self-evaluations with their managers before managers make up their minds. This is not rocket science to imagine that what you say might influence your manager. Right? So we did research with 10 different companies, some of them multinationals, and we found two big problems with the approach. The first one was on gender, that women generally evaluated themselves more harshly. That could be because maybe women are more less self-confident than men, or maybe women have learned from the Heidi effect that they could afford to brag less than men. But we also found big cross-cultural differences, that there are definitely cultures in the world where shining the spotlight on yourself is not what you do, and you are very harsh in self-evaluation compared to other cultures where we're much more used to kind of um, talking about our own achievements. There's no evidence, no practice, no nothing suggesting that sharing these self-evaluations with your manager does any good other than bias your manager and leading to a vicious circle where kind of your own experiences, wherever they might come from, further affect your performance appraisals and your future in an organization. So that's another thing that we should stop um, uh, as soon as we can. Okay, so now I want to talk a little bit about kind of broader context of um, uh, work and school. And in fact, I want to take you back to the SAT. Um, I don't know how many uh, multiple choice tests, whether they are still common in medicine or not. They are. Well, I, w I didn't prepare for that. But anyway, so I'll, I'll tell you what the research shows. So a few years ago, a doctoral student of mine, Katie Baldiga Kaufman, um, came to my office. And she, in fact, she first wanted to study something quite different, at uh, the surface different. But you'll see, in fact, it is quite similar. So the surface, she was like, you know, uh, women don't speak as much uh, in the classroom, in teams, in meetings. I want to study this. And so we're like, well, that's hard. I mean, you have to, I mean, how are you going to measure, observe millions of meetings? Hard problem. So she then all of a sudden occurred to her that the problem of not speaking up in class or not speaking up in a meeting might be related uh, to <coughs> women's higher bars that they set for themselves until they are willing to speak. So uh, what research suggests is that on average, kind of, you have to be 95% sure, women have to be 95% sure before they speak up, but that bar is much lower for men. So in multiple choice um, uh, questions, as you know, sometimes you have to guess. I mean, if you know the answer, no problem. But sometimes you have to guess. In the SAT, as you might recall, if you don't know the answer, there are two options. You either guess and you check a box, or you skip the question. So if women are less self-confident and more risk averse than men, they might be more likely to skip rather than guess. And that's exactly what she studied. So she brought people to the lab, they had to take the SAT, standard SAT, but then because this was a lab study, in the second round she could force everyone to answer every question. So therefore she could measure what people would have known had they answered all the questions. And she finds that just the skipping costs women dearly on the SAT. We then lucked out that the college board appointed a new chair in Dave Coleman in 2012, who was very interested in revisiting the SAT more generally, also in terms of gender equality. And I'm happy to say that this year is the first year where the new SAT has been rolled out with a gender de-biased multiple choice part. The college board could have done many different things, and in fact, we tested many different things in the lab. They could have forced everyone to answer every question, they could have increased the penalty you know, to an, incre an enormous amount so that nobody would ever guess. So the penalty, you might recall, the penalty, just to refresh your memory, you get one point for right answers and a quarter point deduction for wrong answers. So you know, a little bit of math will tell people and a little bit of course preparation will tell people it's pretty rational to guess relatively early on. But that was the old SAT. So you could have either forced everyone to answer every question or increase the penalty to you know, 10 points deduction or done away with the penalty completely. And that's what the College Board, in fact, decided to do. Kind of saying, this is not a test that was written to measure people's willingness to take risks. This was a test to measure ability, and therefore, we want to level the playing field 
independent of people's propensity to take risks. <coughs> that really is the power of design. That is probably one of the studies I'm most proud of. We can actually feel and see the power of a little bit of insight into our minds and a little bit of insight in how you might redesign the world. But we can take kind of a broader um, perspective here and go to a very different place. I'm actually going to India for a second to suggest to you that role models are really important. And I know that is uh, at the heart of many of you in your thinking about kind of seminars, speakers, portraits on your walls, conferences, it actually does matter. And the best evidence comes from this research here. Uh, India in 1993 amended its constitution with the provision that a third of village heads had to be reserved for women. It was beautiful from a research point of view because the third was literally picked out of a hat. So random, um, random assignment, therefore you could, could kind of show what difference this is really making. And lots of papers have been written on this and lots of different impacts. The one I want to focus on here is that in villages, which in those about 24 years now have been exposed to at least two female leaders, mindsets have started to change. So now these people are more likely to associate political leadership with women. In fact, it's the most recent paper which was published in Science showing that one of the core career aspirations of parents in those villages is for their daughters to become politicians. I'm not saying this is rational, <coughs> but I am saying that it triggers people's imaginations. The possibility, it enlarges the possibility set. So I started out by saying that minds are hard to change. They are hard to change. But 20 years might not be that long. Right? <coughs> so I'm not saying we shouldn't work on this. We shouldn't try to influence what we think is, is possible. But we should do it in parallel to making it easier for us to do the right thing. So here's one thing that uh, the Kennedy School did, um, and I mean shamefully actually, I have to say, that it's only uh, now 12 years ago that we realized that of the 50 portraits on our walls of leaders, exactly zero were of women. So 50% of our students are female, and I can attest that it wasn't our conscious effort to signal to our female students that they weren't made to be leaders. It was unconscious. This is Jenny Mansbridge, a professor at the school. She was the one to notice one day, wake up and say, oh my God, where are the women on our walls? So we've now changing this, the portrait project. This is Ellen Johnson Surley, the president of Liberia, also a graduate of the school, many, many more portraits. So it does matter what we see. And yes, there's hope. Um, <laughs> we do have uh, some uh, female role models now, uh, but some of you, you know, nothing um, goes down without a bitter pill here. You might recall that then Monopoly created a special version of this particular episode of Star Wars only to forget the female protagonist. So all male figures. Monopoly has corrected this since, so Ray now is part of the Monopoly um, game set, but it just goes to show how deep those biases are. Okay, so role models are important. Now let me kind of uh, talk about kind of the last topic, which is arguably the hardest one. And that is how to make diversity work. But the problem is that we're actually pretty comfortable in groups that look like us. So research on diversity in teams, in fact, does show that diverse teams tend to outperform homogenous teams. But here's the sad news. They also find that when you ask teams after they have done the work, how well do you think your team performed and how enjoyable was it? Diverse teams will say, it was hard work, and I don't think our team did well. Why? Because we're in fact experiencing what we want these teams to experience, and that is conflict and debate. We don't want them to fall into the trap of group think, where we all just run into one direction. But debate is hard work. So diversity is hard work, and that is an important message for all of us, uh, that you know, we shouldn't just expect people to be able to do this. Um, diversity and inclusion, of course, even more, is hard work. And inclusion is required in addition to diversity. But yes, so numbers do matter. So I'll, um, diversity is important in the sense that if you are the only one, only woman, only man, only African American, only Swiss, whatever it might be, you will be taken as a token. Roughly speaking, a third 
or three kind of of a kind um, is very helpful in removing this need to put you into a particular category. So numbers do matter, but we certainly have to move beyond numbers and go into the question of how do we uh, turn this into an inclusive environment. In fact, I just want to show you a picture here and ask you to tell me where you would be more likely to drop a piece of paper. <laughs> yeah. um, I think that speaks for itself, and I'm arguing that that's the kind of environment that we want to create. That we need to create the kind of environment in our team, in our team meetings, where people aren't, don't feel the permission to drop a dirty joke. And so going back to my example before, where I argued that we have to translate insights into unconscious bias, into the behaviors, the micro inequities, the interruptions, the not giving credit to comments, and then turn this into behavioral interventions, that's kind of what I have in mind here. That's where we have to go. And here's one example uh, that is just an example, me observing what a company, an organization did um, not based on research, but so they were very determined to go down this path, go from just awareness raising to capacity building. And so they wrote down a list of all the micro inequities that they were concerned about, included sexist jokes, but also included interruptions, lots of other things. And then they thought about what would it take to make this actionable in our next meeting? And if we just then put the list into the drawer, <coughs> nothing's ever gonna come out of it. So what they did was they created little red flags that they took to the meetings, and they would raise the red flag whenever a trans trans transgression occurred. <laughs> now, why the red flag? They actually spent quite a bit of time talking about not wanting to criminalize transgression. Right? That will really destroy the meeting. But at the same time, it should be noticeable enough for people to pause for a second and think, oh my God. You know, you just used another example, you know, of the typical category or not inclusive language, for example. So that's the kind of thing that I'm hoping for. But I also have to warn you, we have not done nearly enough research to understand how we can get from here to here and what it really would take. But I do think kind of the idea of the red flag more as an idea of A, identifying what transgressions are, and B, thinking about what behaviors it would take to make it easier for us to live up to our virtuous ideals. That's kind of the way to go. So transparency in many ways, kind of measuring, talking about things, bringing things into the open, is definitely, I think, a necessary ingredient of where we need to go. We also can become smarter in communicating the information or the norms that we want to share. So here's an example that is probably close to some of your hearts. Um, this is the food pyramid that you are certainly familiar with that we have been using in this country for decades uh, to help all of us understand what healthy eating might look like. So here's the very deep insight. And that is we do not eat of pyramids. <laughs> so now our new um, image here is a food plate. And as you can see already, it's so much more intuitive to look at the food plate and think about what your normal plate looks like. So in my case, I love dairy products. I think the dairy glass truly is wrong. <laughs> Must be much bigger. Um, so sometimes it, take, you know, it takes this holistic approach of thinking about what's broken, but then also being smart about kind of redesigning and communicating kind of the new message. I want to end by giving you an example from the UK, which was, in fact, quite successful in moving one part of the gender diversity puzzle, and that is gender diversity in corporate boards. As you might know, the UK is one of the few countries uh, which was able to increase gender diversity on corporate boards substantially without the introduction of quotas. In fact, they relied on a big coalition um, of players, also relied on a lot of behavioral science, kind of to make this happen. And here's just one example. So in 2013, um, I got a call from then Vince Cable, who was the Secretary of Business and Innovation, uh, because they had kind of stalled. The movement had started in 2011 with the 30% Club, which is an NGO focusing on increasing gender diversity and the government with its independent um, review committee, the Davis Review, 
kind of working towards increasing gender diversity. But they had to have make some progress, but then stalled. Um, in any case, so I, I traveled to London, we did a number of things, and here's just one example of the things we did for them. So they sent me this, which was the cover of their brochure in 2013, a report on what the companies had done in terms of gender diversity. And it talked about uh, the fact that 17% of board members were female in 2013. Here's why I was concerned. Sometimes descriptive norms describing how the world is, 17% are women, can turn into prescriptive norms in our minds. So the more I tell you that there are only few women, the more you start to think that that's probably how the world is, and that's probably how the world should be. So we changed uh, the communication for them, um, also the verbal communication, but also the cover sheet um, of that report. And we're still focusing on the 100 biggest companies, so that's the FTSE 100, so same data set. Uh, and this is still you know, honestly reporting the truth, but we're now talking about the companies which already are diverse, which companies have already one or more women on their board. And we're now creating an image that says 94% of the companies are diverse. I mean, if you're not part of the club, you're really an outlier. So we want to create a movement. We want to create kind of social norms, move the social norms in the desired directions, not undermining, in fact, our efforts. Okay. So if you're interested in learning more about this, um, do visit our um, Gender Action Portals online platform, um, openly available to anyone, where we summarize research and the kind of research that I described today, typically based on experiments or randomized controlled trials. Uh, to examine what works and what doesn't work, um, and, or read my book, of course. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> with that, um, I wish you good luck designing change. Thank you very much. So would you take some questions? Yes, I'm absolutely Great. happy to take some questions. Are you going to call? Oh, call. Thank you very much. That was terrific. Um, you said that and I'm going to repeat the question for everyone because it might be hard to hear from them. You said having diversity on search committees won't necessarily overcome unconscious bias. But if we have a diverse committee and the committee selects a woman or a committee from another diverse background, will the candidate be more likely to come because they saw a diverse committee? Yes. So the question was um, referring to my earlier comment that diversity on the evaluation committee uh, does not help us overcome unconscious bias. But you very um, astutely made the remark that maybe diversity on the committee has other purposes other than helping us unconscious, uh, overcoming unconscious bias. And the two most important ones, is, uh, you're exactly right, the two most important ones are that the diverse committee might have different networks to reach out to. Right? So even as they're sourcing candidates, they might um, cast the net more widely uh, than a homogenous committee. And the second advantage is the one that you just mentioned in that for the candidate, it is, uh, research in fact shows this, is it is in fact important to see people like him or herself on the committee to imagine that somebody like her or him could make it in this organization. Yeah, so absolutely. Please. No, please. Yes. So I was wondering about um, the available data or, or, and or your opinion um, regarding the um, effect of a more flexible work environment on productivity and promotion for women. So for example, what I recently um, came to know is that there are very few uh, professors uh, at the University of Medicine at Harvard Medical School, and there's a fall off. And they've even tracked this in terms of women's aspirations and expectations. And initially, they track with men, and at a certain point, they sharply fall off. And I, I would guess, although they didn't tell us exactly, <coughs> that it probably coincides with other responsibilities, such as family responsibilities, children, and this kind of thing. So that's that's where my question comes from. Does, yep. Is there data that a more flexible work environment, such as you know, yep. working you know from home or something yep. like this, does that does that kind of a model decrease women's productivity or does it increase <coughs> it and does it affect um, positively promotion 
and you know, and whatever. Yeah. So um, yes, there's data, and there's very good research on the question, uh, with the caveat that it's typically not experimental. So it, it, it's hard to um, you know, to really get ca causal inferences on. Here's I'm randomly giving you uh, selectability, but not this group, and then I'll see. So we don't have that kind of evidence. Um, so that's a caveat. But if that interests you, you should absolutely uh, Google Claudia Golden, who is a professor at the Harvard Economics Department. She also was the chair of the American Economic Association, and which was quite revolutionary that as the chair, she gave the, oh, the president, because I'm the president, she got the presidential address, and for the first time, the presidential address focused on gender, economics and gender. And the theme of the address was the last chapter. And the last chapter she defines as questions around time. So not just flexibility, but questions around time. And she um, and Larry Katz and some others have done really super interesting work in just looking at correlations between jobs that have either more or less flexibility and kind of controlling for everything else. Um, they also looked at um, kind of not just flexibility, but kind of time on and off the job. So on ramps, off ramps, you take time out to be with your family for a year or two, how long can you do that, et cetera. And there's absolutely a correlation, um, both on women's workforce participation in a given sector, um, depending <coughs> on time flexibility and time, kind of face time required on the job, um, and also in terms of career advancement. So I think your hunch is exactly right. Uh, I have seen, so I um, wrote the book actually while I was on sabbatical in Australia and uh, uh, worked with a telecommunications company, Telstra, uh, in Australia. And they've really been uh, just amazing at uh, kind of the forefront uh, of kind of trying out different things to equalize the playing field. And they turned, uh, kind of using behavioral insights, turned flexibility into the default assumption. So meaning, why are you in the office today? Explain to me, why can't you work from home? And can't you, can't you arrange that more flexibly? I mean, to really make flexibility the default. Um, it, uh, this is not an experiment, just for me tracking what, what happened, but immediately kind of doubled uh, applications from women. Uh, so it, it, so it, it, I think it is flexibility, but you also have to make it acceptable. Right? So one of the problems right now still is you kind of have to ask for it, or you're kind of the outlier compared to the norm. And so it will hurt you even more. So I think we have to do flexibility, but we have to do actually more than that. We have to make it really kind of socially acceptable. I agree because there, uh, there's an assumption that flexibility is for, you know, departing from the normal model for environments of work, which means that you're trying not to work. Yeah. So yeah we have to move away from the signal of kind of this is lack of commitment. Right. Yes, please. this double bind that's always discussed around being able to advocate for yourself, but um, also not coming off as someone who's overly aggressive, because I think there's, there's a different line that people <coughs> often talk about. And concrete advice for, for people on either side of that table. Mm. Appreciate it. Yeah, I don't know I have that much concrete advice. Um, <laughs> so I, I mean, it's a huge problem. Um, so my, I will go in, into more kind of concrete um, steps in just a second, but I think that the biggest message for me it still has to be we have to change organizations, not fix people. So as long as we, we put this on women's shoulders as in just figure this out, this negotiation thing, um, you know, it's not going to work. Now having said this, uh, I am teaching or have been teaching negotiation, so it's, uh, it's totally clear to me that I can't tell my female students, let me fix the environment first and then come back in 100 years. Um, and then, you know, you can negotiate successfully. So, so I, I get it. So I get it that, you know, in the interim, what, what, can, what can you say? Um, so there's a number of people who have Hannah Riley Bowles at the Kennedy School, for example, a good colleague of mine, um, has done some, some really interesting work on what, what the negotiators might be doing. But I don't want to overpromise. I mean, Sher Sheryl Sandberg, of course, used a lot of her work and also quotes a lot of her work in uh, Lean In, so has taken that approach and kind of to argue that women should be leaning in more um, but it, it, we don't have a ton of evidence on what works. So here's kind of two things. Um, one is kind of helpful, but not that helpful. So, it is, so when women negotiate on behalf of someone else, they don't have the double bind. 
because you can be both caring about, let's say you're an attorney, you can care about your client or you're a doctor, you advocate on behalf of your patient, you can conform with our stereotypes of the caring, you know, motherly role and still be a lioness in the courtroom. So for most negotiations, not your salary negotiations, sadly, but for most negotiations, in fact, we don't find gender gaps. So as soon as you do this on behalf of somebody else, you're fine. You're, you're now women. I'm not going to speak for women for a moment. Um, because we don't find that for men at all. Um, now, the question is, you know, can we remind ourselves why we negotiate, in, even if we negotiate for ourselves? I mean, can we kind of think about the future families that we will have, the future children we'll have to send to schools, our aging parents we'll have to take care of? Might this help us? So researchers have tried that, and it does help. Um, it boosts your own self-confidence, but it doesn't necessarily take away the backlash you might experience from the person at the other side of the table, because they, you know, they will still perceive you as, oh, she's just doing this for herself. So what an assertive woman she is. So, um, so, so, so that's what I'm saying. It's, it's not super encouraging. So the other thing, and um, that gets even more uncomfortable for me, but the other thing that Hannah and actually many others found, and that Cheryl also talks about, uh, in her book is try to combine assertiveness with femininity. Mm. Um, that's what I'm saying. Right now. I can't really do the hair thing right now. But that's not... um, so that's hard. It's hard for me to even send that message and tell my female students, well, you know, you just have to be more inclusive and more feminine and kind of try to be assertive and feminine at the same time and you know, just do this dance and it's easy to do. It really isn't, it really isn't. And uh, not that I wanna go back to the election that we've just gone through, but uh, you know, I mean, Hillary Clinton was very well aware of that dilemma of being both, you know, how can you be both likable and competent at the same time? So that's all I will say about this. So I don't have great advice, right, um, uh, for the ne negotiators. I think for those of us negotiating <clears throat> with people who apply uh, for example, salary negotiations, uh, <clears throat> one thing that Hannah also found that influenced my behavior as academic dean, uh, in fact, was to make negotiability very transparent. So I was very upfront with people on what's negotiable, what's less negotiable. So for example, salary, typically there's a little bit of wiggle room, but not much in academia. I mean, internal equity is really important for us. Um, I think for good reasons. Um, so, so I would say that. I mean, that, you know, I mean, uh, just a tiny bit. But you know, if you know, if you need more research support, happy to talk about that. Tell me why. Tell me how you think about this. You know, we should really have a uh, discussion. We didn't call it a negotiation. We should have a discussion about kind of, you know your needs. I can't promise I can meet everything, but I try to make negotiability at least acceptable and suggest to both male and females. I mean, I use the same protocol for everyone that this is a situation where you can and should negotiate and I will not punish you for kind of asking. Last question. Oh, last question? Please. Please. Okay, um, so I'm wondering about uh, another question going back to evaluating job candidates and behavior-based questions. They're very popular. People say that that's the best way to determine future behavior is by how you handle them and what you've done in the Can past. Can you speak up a little bit? Sure, yeah. Please. Um, Is there a difference between the way that a man would answer them and a woman would answer them? Uh, um, number one. Number two, do you agree? Do you think that they are a good way of predicting future job behaviors? Um, <laughs> the true answer is I don't know. Um, so you, you know, the truest answer is that we don't measure nearly enough. So HR, in many ways, still is the... I don't know, the, the epitome of kind of intuition and I'm just going to feel it. So I don't think I have enough evidence to answer your, your question. But if you're interested in that question, so the best book on the broad topic is actually a book that was written by um, the, what was his title? Um, whatever, the, the chair of the People Analytics Department of Google. They call it, no, they call it People Operations Department. So the HR department is called People Operations. And he wrote a book, Laszlo Bock is his name, and he wrote a book, it's called Work Rules. And you know, this being Google, they measured everything. So they did structured interviews, they did work sample tests, and then, and that's of course the approach we have to use, then they measured which of our work sample tests, so which of our questions actually were predictive afterwards, 
a year, two, five years from now for these people's success in the organization. And that's kind of exactly where you have to go. And I absolutely believe that there are um, biased questions that will lead to different responses. But the good news is now I'm going to end on a happy note um, that I am actually very excited about. Um, there are now about 20-ish uh, of startup companies, some of which have developed software based on the book of my book, um, What Works, really translating this, this, this research into software that companies um, can use. And one of them is called Pymetrics, and they specifically focus on developing de-biased tests. Uh, there's many more. One is called, for example, Applied, which allows people to um, anonymize CVs, uh, do work sample tests, lots of other things. So there's a whole list of them, which I think is going to make it easier for organizations, small and large, but even small ones, which might not even have an HR department, to actually use those insights relatively cheaply and quickly. And with that, thank you very much.